Hello, welcome to The Promised Land, a show about Manchester United and part of the 90 Min Podcast Network. I'm Scott Saunders, joined as ever by Rob Blanchett. Rob, we have football to talk about. We have two Manchester United preseason friendlies to talk about. We have eight goals to talk about against Liverpool and Melbourne victory. We have one goal conceded, <laughs> which uh, maybe indicates a little bit of a problem. Maybe we'll talk about that in a bit. But overall, the last couple of days have been quite positive, haven't they? They've been positive. Sorry, one of my children just walked in the door there and I just waved them out as they turned the light on. Um, but eight <laughs> goals, one conceded. If we keep that ratio going into the season, Scott, might win something. But it's just been, uh, I think, really interesting to see these first two games under Ten Hag, how he's setting up, what he's telling people to do. Yes, it's a bit of a jog around for some players. It's about fitness. You don't really look at the results too strongly. You don't get too excited about it. But what I really, really like about all of this is just seeing that there is a purpose. And that's what we wanted, wasn't it? That we're not just seeing things just unfold naturally on their own. This is about a new manager coming in, taking these players and actually showing that they're not that bad. So a good first couple of results and lots to talk about. If you listen to the Liverpool fan contingent after the friendly on, what was it, Tuesday, these are just preseason friendlies. They don't mean anything. You can't take anything out of these games. Stop celebrating like you've won the league, et cetera, et cetera. But it's, <laughs> it's quite nice to... Obviously, nobody, nobody thinks that. Even in my tweet about it and joke about it and that kind of thing. Nobody means that. It's just important to for United fans to kind of look at this team, as you say, Rob. And look at the purpose and the patterns that are starting to be introduced, even after a few weeks of training. Uh, yeah. Because they haven't played like this for a long time. So, yeah, I mean, uh, on the show today, we'll talk about those friendlies. We'll talk about the Liverpool game a little bit. We'll talk about uh, the Melbourne victory victory on Friday. We'll talk about who impressed, who didn't, what, what did we learn? Uh, we'll talk about some players who have impressed uh, a new midfield axis of the future. I know Rob would like to potentially talk about. Uh, we'll talk about the transfer targets as well. Frankie de Jong, Bernardo Silva to Barcelona, Robert Lewandowski to Barcelona. How the hell are they doing this? We'll see. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about Lisandro Martinez as well. Should be on the verge of joining United over the course of the next few days. We'll talk a bit maybe at the end about Jesse, uh, Jesse Lingard and Cristiano Ronaldo and their Saudi Arabia offers. Um, but yes, just a reminder, you can subscribe to our show wherever you get our, your podcasts on Apple, Google, Spotify, and the likes. And watch us twice a week on Tuesdays and Fridays as well. So head over to YouTube, hit the like button, join the community, subscribe, leave a comment. And the links should be in the description of this episode if you're listening on an audio platform. Twitter, at underscore Scott Saunders, at underscore Rob underscore B, at Promised Land MU for the show. Give us a follow, get in touch, and listen to the rest of the show as we now move on to some preseason friendly chat so overall rob let's should we start with liverpool or do you want to start on today's game we could do both together but hey beating liverpool four four nil it's pretty exciting isn't it gonna win the league <laughs> gonna win uh, the champions league like yeah. just put us in the champions league now just give us a place because we're manchester united you know the biggest club in the world and we'll go win that in our lovely new shirt with collars <laughs> I actually do. I said this on the sh on the in, in the WhatsApp chat the other day that I didn't actually like the shirt when it came out in the pictures. Uh, but always, you know, shirts always seem to look better when they're in the flesh or on TV. I think you or were saying you hated the shirt, Scott. I hate that shirt. What is that shirt? This I don't hate it like... anymore, but I don't love it. It's not my favorite. When you shirt, look at but... your WhatsApp on your phone, there's like eighteen messages of "I hate the shirt." And they're all from Scott. <laughs> so yeah, you can see. Uh, look, I think the shirt looks kind of classical. I think I like it even more now. Now I've seen it, obviously, from the press photos. And now we're seeing our footballers actually in it. We should have. I think the new kit is being, new away kits being launched on Saturday. I think this is. Uh, so you'll be able to see that over the weekend. And I have seen leaks of that. And I do like that one. So we'll uh, we'll see. But yes, two presents. Pre-season friendlies, two wins over Liverpool and Melbourne victory. Uh, what is the biggest takeaway from the two games that you've had, Rob? Is it that tactical plans are starting to show up? Is it that these players are not actually useless, like most fans have seemed to think over the last six months? 
What's your takeaways? I think two things, two main things. The seeds of pressing is number one. So we're seeing that players have been instructed to press certain parts of the pitch off the ball. This is a really important part, off the ball and on the ball. So that first bit is the bit United have been horrendous about at, at four years. You know, Ranyut wanted them to do it and United were like, what? Press off the ball? But the second one, I think, is the ball recycling. So you can see a little bit more effort towards keeping the ball and playing playing passes that are much more high percentage passes so that they stick. You're not losing the ball. Because let's be honest, Manchester United have been terrible at progressing the ball from back to front, losing the ball constantly in a kind of almost like pantomime style. So those two things we've seen much more kind of evident in these two matches. But what's it led to, Scott? It's led to two wins in these games. So even though they've not been perfect, they certainly weren't perfect against Liverpool, it shows that you can have a system with these same players that everyone doesn't like, you know, the ones who are failures and they're awful and they're this, that and the other. I think Ten Hag's looking at them and going, hang on, you're all international footballers. Be better. And we're seeing that. I think we've seen that. But then again... I think we still see the same issues, say, with Fred and McTominay. So you see them give the ball away today against Melbourne in that first half, and it was pretty rank to see. And then you saw the two young lads come on for them, uh, Zidane and Savage, and they were both technically brilliant. Kept the ball, long passing, short passing, intelligent football, and you're like, whoa, these two kids, they could start for Man United over McFred. So there's these little things, these little pockets of partnerships that we've seen in just these two games. And this is why this tour is so important, because this will be about developing these partnerships and having viable options when you start the first Premier League game. Yeah, of course, United have lost uh, players in central midfield over the course of the summer. So it's good to see uh, Zidane Bell and Charlie Savage getting their chances. They've really taken them with, with both hands, to be honest. There's some... I see Zidane is already getting uh, reels cut up and posted on social media of like little, little turns and this kind of thing. He looks very mm. technically, very good, very composed. Uh, there was a point against Liverpool where he, he was playing, obviously, against their first-choice midfield for the majority of the, the, the half that he was playing uh, and took the ball, took it backwards a little bit and worked his way out of the space and, pre- and proceeded forward with it, which was quite composed for a young lad. I know it's preseason, but... It's good for him to get that, you know, those confident moments under his belt, you know. So uh, maybe this this is a the start of a nice development into first team football throughout the course of the season for him. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah, I think it's quite encouraging, isn't it? I don't I don't think what have we learned about McFred? <laughs> I guess maybe going back to that, uh, McTominay obviously scored. Fred obviously scored a delicious lob over Allison in the Liverpool game. But obviously, there's still limitations there. They still look like McFred. Now, this is the thing. I've never been massively low on them compared to, I think, the wider Manchester United fan base, where people have got obviously think they're the worst two footballers on earth at times, but especially Scott McTominay. But I think more than anything, it's at this stage, Scott, it's about options. And I think when you look at, say, the four players we've just spoken about, you start to lean towards technicality as opposed to physicality and experience. So yes, Fred and McTominay, highly experienced footballers compared to the two young lads. But where's the point where you kind of cut the the loaf in half and say, no, this is the half of the loaf we're going towards now. We want to keep the ball better. So do you know what? This 19-year-old's better than that 20-whatever-year-old. So that's, I think, kind of where Ten Hag is. And this is why you need this coach. You need this coach because it's a fresh pair of eyes on an old problem. And if you're going to keep the ball and become a technical side and you're going to do that every week in the Premier League, I think you're good off starting with youngsters. You know, you can say to these youngsters, right, you do everything I tell you, you play minutes. If you don't, you go sit on the bench or you go back to the reserves or you go out on loan or something like that. Uh, I've been just equally as impressed with Savage as I have been with Zidane, simply because they're different players Savage has got such an incredible vocabulary with the ball at his feet. He can move it anywhere, literally, from that number six position. And Zidane is a creative who can play deeper, so a bit more like De Jong, really, in many many kind of 
in comparable terms. If you've already got them in your pocket, Scott, you're good to go. You can start using these guys. They'll make mistakes as we go forward, but they'll learn from them. And that's so, so important. Eric Ten Hag has said after the game, uh, the Melbourne victory game, that is a really compact opponent who sat so far back waiting for us. I think the team reacted really good, though, because obviously they conceded within the first five minutes uh, with a high line that was uh, Harry Maguire. Looked like he was going to fall over, but unfortunately... Leaning uh, Tower of Pisa. It was like yeah. that, wasn't it? I feel, I feel for him in a way, but, you know... Needs must in this new system. Uh, we created a lot on the right side where Jaden Sancho ended up playing. Obviously, United are targeting Anthony as well later in the window by the seams of it. But do we have a potential... Well, Sancho was signed for the right-hand side and the Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's wisdom, you know. Uh, but against an opponent that comes forward, it's easier when they're, when they're sat back. You have to invest more in running. Ten Hag also said... We took these players with us so I could get an impression. They need all to get a chance. They can, If they can contribute immediately or if they need a loan period. So he's talking about the young players there. Uh, and yeah, it, it's some positive comments. Let's go back to that right-hand side comment there. Um, I know you tweeted about Jaden Sancho's. Uh, he's had a year. Didn't go well for him, really. Didn't get the shirt number he was promised. Cast to the side a little bit. Is this the time now where he's going to become a main mainstay, main man in this attack? I hope so, yes, because this is what you bought him for. I think we're seeing two very technical differences between Jaden Sancho from last season and to what we're seeing on a tour now. We said we will make that caveat again. That is just the tour. It is pre-season. Things can change. But the, the core difference that I can see is that when you looked at Solskjaer's Sancho and Ranić Sancho compared to now Ten Hag Sancho, is that in those earliest incarnations, he was almost played as a winger. He was almost on that touchline, that byline, all the time. He was getting the ball this close to his marker, like in his face. No room at all to work at all. No, it's not his thing at all. At uh, Dortmund, why was he so good? It's because he played in the channel. He found the space in the channel. He could be creative. He could beat people. He could bring the ball into the striker. Haaland loved all that at Dortmund. It worked perfectly. So doesn't it make sense to shape your team around that that the player does well with? So we can see that already with Ten Hag is that Sancho's got almost like a free roll on that right. He can go wide, he can go behind, he can come short and he's been told to do the basics. So he has to press that side as well without the ball. He's ticking all those boxes, Scott. So, you know, Anthony is a player that we know Manchester United like and do want. But it's not the essential signing on day one. You know, it's certainly not as essential as, say, Martinez or essential as, say, De Jong. You've got those players, they will come into the team, they'll be automatic starters. I think with Anthony coming in, yes, you'll cost a lot of money. You've already got an amazing right-sided future number seven, dare I say. He'll get that shirt, no doubt about it, finally. But yeah, so I, I think I think with Sancho, it's a case of letting him grow now. Let him carry on what he's doing. The flair that he's shown in his two games has been fantastic. And he just looks a gear fitter. Like he, you can yeah, see he's been working out. Him and Rashford have been working out all summer long because they want to hit the ground running with a new coach. And you can totally see that in their physicality. Yeah, on Rashford, he did a pre-match presser ahead of the Melbourne game and basically said this is the first time in his career that he's been with United from the very start of the yeah. season, which is crazy, crazy isn't it? Crazy, Absolutely crazy, crazy to think. So he's had, um, he, he needs that, he's had, he said he had more time to rest and recuperate than ever this summer as well, which is good. So hopefully he's come back fresh. Um, just on Sancho before we move on to, I wanted to keep talking about the attack, but just on Sancho do you, and the right-hand side. Do you think that that is, that is his best position where he should continually play? Would you mix him on the other side? And do you think there's enough depth on the right side? Uh, when, when I've kind of done Jadon Sancho profiles in the past and looked at, obviously, what his, his kind of body of work from Dortmund, Dortmund would use him on both sides. He would play left, he would play right. But a lot of his kind of more eye-catching success, of course, came on the right-hand side. You could see that in terms of you know, the way he plays the game, that he can exploit that channel more than the left. But that doesn't mean that he won't play on the left. So, like, if you did buy Anthony, 
you probably would then switch Sancho and have someone more creative on that left hand side. I think you know Sancho is certainly more creative than Rashford. Martial's creative, but maybe doesn't give you the pressing on that side. There's always kind of ups and downs. So I still think that Sancho in the near future might be a number 10. He might be the guy that plays behind a striker eventually because he's just got such great feet and some really good decision making around there. So uh, it, the whole point, Scott, is that you've got him. That's the most important thing. That's what I said a year ago. Here you've got a guy that you can develop. It doesn't matter if day one he's not the best footballer in the world for you. Develop him. He's young. Get him to where he needs to be. And he's now got a coach that can do those things for him. This is the important point. <laughs> That's very, very much the important point. I mean... I talk about Anthony Martial in a bit, but even since like Louis Van Gaal, that that season under Louis Van Gaal, his first season, uh, Anthony Martial was mm. he, he looked a real player there, didn't he? And I know there were a couple of seasons ago Martial scored seventeen in the league under Ollie, but since Van Gaal left, he's not had Mourinho wanting to sell him for the duration of his tenure. Solskjaer worked with him, but he's not really got that reputation for getting the very best out of players, working with them one to one, giving them that you know, close coaching tips, you know, and getting the best out of them, changing their game a little bit in order to make them better than they are. We're seeing that a little bit with Sancho, and I think that's why I'm excited about him this season with Ten Hag. And now Anthony Martial as well has, the, the word was that United want to sell him. He's on a massive wage. He went to Seville last season, didn't really do anything, uh, is now back. United did want to sell him, but I, th I think they're probably leaning towards ending up... This is a gut, gut feeling. I think they're leaning towards keeping him because yeah, I know he scored two goals in preseason. doesn't mean a lot, really, but he, he looks a different player too. What do you think? I think he looks a different player in just the sense of being happy on a football pitch. You know, he, he talked a lot at the end of the season about why he's had such a bad 12 months. And he talked about his injuries and how he really mentally struggled with them and how he tried to get over them. And going to Sevilla was all about playing football because he wasn't playing football at Manchester United. But for me, again, it's about partnerships. The partnership of Anthony Martial is the guy behind him, Bruno Fernandes. Bruno Fernandes, in two games has looked happier and more like Bruno Fernandes with his mate in front of him in Anthony Martial than he has done with the magnificent number seven who doesn't want to play for the football club anymore. So this is always the problem, isn't it? Is that we sometimes look at football in a, in a kind of elitist terms and people go, oh, well, Anthony Martial, he's not as good as Cristiano Ronaldo. But I tell you what, Anthony Martial might be better for Bruno Fernandes and Donny van der Beek behind him than Cristiano. So this is how the manager will decide whether... Martial stays at a football club. Does he have a use? Sebastian Haller was the same kind of player. Awful at West Ham. Really kind of had a terrible time in the Premier League. Went to Ajax. Ten Hag turned him into a top striker again. Because it's all about usage and what you do around the players. I look at Martial. He's never been one of my favourite players. I was there. The day he came on against Liverpool and ran that left channel and skinned them on his, on his debut and scored that amazing goal and the place went wild. But as you highlighted, that was a long time ago now. But can he be a player, say, for United players as a number nine this year in this system, 4 2 three, one. Can he score 16 goals, 17 goals and get you eight assists? Yes, 100% depend on what, what's around him with Sancho on the right, with Bruno behind him. You can pull those strings. So I'm willing to give it a go. I know a lot of United fans are not. They kind of go, oh, you need a top striker. You need this, that or the other. But there are players at our football club that have been badly coached over a long time period of time i'm willing to give ten Hag that option to decide on whether they're worthy of the shirt or whether they need to be sold anyone else really impressed you uh do you want to do you want to do a little eric by bit playmaker extraordinaire <laughs> I, I, do you know it's again let's 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 apply the same science so we'll talk a little bit about martinez soon but lissandra martinez will be signing for manchester united we know that he plays the left side of cent uh, center back he also plays as a defensive midfielder. He can play left back. Who do you play with Lissandra Martinez if Rafa Varane's foot falls off every two, three, four weeks? Because that's what could happen. That's what you have to decide. So Eric Bailly has not done himself like kind of any harm. He really hasn't. Like he's made two or three mistakes in the games and you kind of go, oh, typical Eric Bailly. But you hope with better coaching that he might be able to get rid of some of that those bad habits. And it could be a case that Bailly and Martinez is your starting back two when Varane is injured. 
Now that's a big jump on a uh, on Harry and on Victor, but those two guys have got to be better. You know, they've just got to be better. They're, they've not yeah, been let, good let, enough the last, the last twelve months, that. and let's, they're let's slow. They're slow, and they uh, on the ball. They're fine. They're both technical defenders. They're ball movers. They can do that. They can carry, but off the ball, they are shocking. If I am I if I'm a striker running a back two. God, I would love to play against them every week. Just stand between them and run in a straight line, and they have not got a chance because they're too slow. Eric Bailly is quick. Lissandra Martinez is quick. Lissandra Martinez will kick someone into row Z rather than lose the ball. I don't think Maguire and Lindelof have got that in their game. The butcher. The butcher. Uh, just I'm going to uh, get, have to get a butcher T-shirt or hat or something like that because I'm going to have to start a butcher section on the show every week, I think. A little two-minute section of what did Lissandra Martinez do this week to a Premier League attacker? And uh, we can kind of snip that up and put it on Twitter. <laughs> We've been running for 20 minutes, 21 minutes, Rob, about pre-season friendlies. Any final thoughts or should we move on? We'll move on, but I think in two games, eight goals, you've won both those games. You've seen lots of positives, but you've also seen the negatives. You've also seen the ghosts of Manchester United, some of the problems. But that's good, isn't it? Because I think Ten Hag has to see it. He has to see that the centre-backs are not quick and that Man United are not always very good at moving the ball because you've got to get better at those things to start winning games in the Premier League. Yes, indeed. It's encouraging. It's, it's nice to not be talking about defeats etc etc no negatives so far no no huge negatives i think everything is blue sky just seen a quote from ten hag on the defending for the goal uh i think it was from the start high up the pitch the wrong choices and then it ends up like a pack of cards which is a good way of putting it could be a ralph ranyak quote that couldn't it <laughs> um just before we move on rob I, like we will talk about lisandra martinez but as we've been recording this and after this episode comes out this this episode might even be out after this is announced but apparently christian erickson is being announced at 3 p.m uk time which is about an hour uh according to uh chat on social media i mean if that doesn't happen we are expecting it to happen at some point anyway the medical with christian erickson has been taking place recently been described as extensive to me obviously just making sure of uh health etc etc and it's the right move to make uh doing their due diligence but it would be great to have christian erickson in as a manchester united player oh completely and again talking about the pre-season tour you can see where those deficiencies in say passing and retention are that someone like christian erickson does take you up another level and, and i said again about you know how do you bring in players that are not all worth say 100 million pound can you get people on freeze on lower on the lower side of it and say to them, yeah, you're a free agent. We'll give you 150 grand a week. Come and do a job for us. Christian Eriksen's totally of that ilk. So as you said there, we know the announcement is coming. Manchester United are very keen to announce him on the tour. I don't know why. Again, I, 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 in terms of strategy with, com with commerce, it's always nice to be able to put a new player in a shirt, isn't it? And show them off and talk about it in the middle of a tour. Um, but I'm really excited about this sign. I think he's going to be a a much bigger part than maybe other Man United fans believe because I think this is a good opportunity for him after everything that went wrong for him, obviously with his health, with Denmark and all of that. This is for him his chance, isn't it? He showed at Brentford last year he's a top player. He's still going to be a top player. And I think that Man United, he's the perfect piece that can play at number 10 or on the right-hand side or a bit deeper in midfield. Just give you options of players that are not going to lose the ball. So we are talking about Christian Eriksen prior to his announcement as a United player, although we are expecting it quite soon. And Rob and I are both quite happy that he will become a Manchester United player or if you are listening to this after it's been announced that he is a Manchester United player. But uh, one other player who will be on, well, taking the number six shirt, I presume, is uh, is Lisandro Martinez. Uh, Paul Pogba vacated that. He's worn that for clubs in the past uh, this one is basically done as well. So United are going to go from one player arriving to three within the space of a few hours, probably expecting Lisandro Martinez to be announced if maybe Friday, maybe Saturday, or maybe next early next week at the very latest. But uh, this one's done too. 55 million euros are all in, I think with some add-ons included in that overall figure. United have gone a little bit higher than they intended to initially, but 
Ajax have come down from a position where they, I think they wanted 60 million euros at one point. So an agreement's been struck. Personal terms are done. Everything is done pretty much. And you're happy with this one too. Very happy. And the more I think about it, and the more I kind of analyze some of the data and some of the stuff that United need and don't need, I'm starting to feel that this might be the most important signing of the summer for Manchester United. I'm starting to feel that. Not, not because I've just watched Harry Maguire as I uh, texted you reverse like a Securicor vehicle, you know, back in defence in, in his first game back, but more because I just think you need someone that is the maybe the cultural heartbeat of your team. And United don't have that with Ten Hag, not in the early days. He's a guy who's going to come in on day one, know exactly what the manager wants, and he's going to bite legs without giving the ball away, without being... You know, people celebrate Alan Wan-Bissaka making tackles. They go, oh, he can tackle, he can tackle. He can't possible. That's a problem. So someone like Lissandra Martinez, yes, he's five foot nine. When you look at his heading stats, they're not a problem. They're very good. I think they're actually better than Maguire's heading stats uh, when you look overall in the league year to year to year. But more than that, he is a ball player who can play out the back and is a defensive entity. He just will not let players get past him. He'll either foul them or he'll stop them and move the ball on really, really quickly. So I'm feeling more about that now in terms of a player that can come in, play central defence, play uh, defensive midfield, play on the left side. Obviously, we've got two very good left backs now. And just have someone there that is, I think, maybe the de facto future captain of Manchester United. Hmm, big claim, but he's got that personality, right? He's, yeah. you know, it, it does seem like he's been, de- well, he's Ajax's player of the year last year. I think I've seen uh, comments from Ajax fans suggesting that he is one player who absolutely gives everything for the shirt and will always do that. And United, if there's anything we've learned about United's players over the past few months, not all of them have that quality. Yeah, so, you think uh, about when, when Gabriel Hanze came to Manchester United. That's the exact comparison I was thinking of. Yeah, he, he had a player who could play full-back and play centre-back. Yeah, and, and what he did, and the reason why United fans loved him ve- right from the earliest days, is that not because he didn't make mistakes or, he, you know, he, he wasn't perfect or anything around those, but it was just that his heart was here and it was like that big. And you saw it from day one and he would be like, I will sacrifice to win. And football fans need that. Man United have not had that for a really long time. Players that truly are willing to sacrifice their bodies to win football matches. Lissandra Martinez will be sacrificing everything. And this is why I'm saying about the cultural heartbeat of the team is that there's other players that will come along and get better and become that. You know, someone like Scott McTominay is that kind of figure. But is Scotty good enough on the ball? That's a big question. Lissandra Martinez is brilliant on the ball. And this is why I can see him playing both at centre-back and in the midfield. Shall we move on to uh, Frankie? Then I'm guessing we should. Why not? Uh, nothing's changed, Rob. Really, has it? I mean, the, it's, this is this is like a soap opera now. Uh, just to kind of establish the position, what we understand, we've seen noises from Sport, uh, which is the Barcelona Catalan. You know, one of the biggest Catalan press outlets there is. Uh, say numerous things about... Well, first of all, Joanne Laporta has said in, in the last few weeks, we don't want to sell Frankie at all. We want him to stay, etc. Also, he needs to take a salary cut or he needs to leave. Yeah. Also, Sport is saying mm-hmm. Barcelona might not take him on their preseason tour, which they leave on Saturday. So if you're listening to this after Saturday, we don't know whether that's the case yet and whether he, he's gone with them, which might make it a little bit more difficult or whether he's been left at home, which is pretty much an indicator that get out, mate. Uh, they still owe him £17 million in deferred wages from the COVID pandemic. I think there was one year where he got paid about three million quid, which is in comparison, <laughs> or three million euros, in comparison to what he is owed now. That's a that's a big favour to Frankie de Jong. Uh, he's owed massive, massive amounts over the next four years. And Barcelona need to kind of offload him in order to sign players like Robert Lewandowski, Bernardo Silva, Register Rafinha, who they just bought from Leeds. They want Marcos Alonso. They want Cesar Azpilicueta. They want Jules Koundé. They want all of these different players. They've signed Frank Kessie and Andreas Christensen. They can't register them. How in the hell does Frankie de Jong stay at Barcelona, Rob? How? He doesn't. 
It's as simple as that. So, you, you as you said there, and it's right to highlight, Barcelona go out on their tour. And if Frankie is on that plane to the tour, then there's every chance that he stays. And there still might be a little bit of brinkmanship here. Barcelona might say, oh, yeah, go on our tour. As I said, the, the, the transfer window is open for, you know, still best part of 50 days. There's still time to do deals. And this one might run and run and run and run. It's already dull and boring and might, awful. You know. But it might run. However, if he's not on that uh, on that plane, and I think that's that's Bernardo Silva, Silva dependent. You know, Bernardo Silva's a player that Barcelona have wanted for a long time, going way back before Xavi was at the football club. But we also know that Xavi really wants Bernardo Silva over Frankie de Jong. He likes Frankie de Jong, but Bernardo Silva is the kind of player he wants at the heart of his team. So it feels like it's all over for um, for de Jong at Barcelona, in the sense that Barcelona have been briefing Sport and everyone else that they are going to sell this player, whether he likes it or not. So if you're a player, you're not going to say, oh yeah, I want to stay, do you? But you might say, I want to stay unless you pay me. I want my money before I go. Frankie de Jong's been used here all along in terms of trying to get pieces moved, trying to offer money to other football clubs. And the fee that they'll get from Manchester United will no, no certainly be recycled into their system of buying new players. So, uh, as you said, it's, it's kind of a joke. You know, Barcelona have become a joke. Laporta is a joke. The way they run the football club is exactly how Real Madrid used to run 10, 15 years ago with the Galacticos. It was all just spinning wheels and, you know, you're in, you're out. We don't like you anymore. You've been here 10 minutes. Go. We like, we like you. Come here for 10 minutes. It's just a horrible football club. Uh, and I think that over time, players like Frankie de Jong might get wiser and say, actually, I don't want to be at a place like this. So the noises are, like, uh, us included at 90 Min, like the, the UK side of the press as far as we know, Eric Ten Hag has spoken to Frankie de Jong. United are under the impression that de Jong will join them. Uh, personal terms, not expected to be a problem, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm-hmm. Why would United chase a player for 10 weeks if they didn't think that, if they thought in the end that he'd end up rejecting them? I know United uh, have been incompetent in the market, as I've said over the last few episodes, but why? Even, the, even that for Man United is very bad. Now, over the, I think on Thursday... There was a mass of reports coming from Spain of Barcelona might tell De Jong that he's not going on the tour. Barcelona have told De Jong to leave because they need this money for economic purposes to pull the transfer off. And later that was followed by Frankie De Jong has said in no circumstance he is joining Man United. Now, what do you make of that? Because I, as far as we understand, this appears to be from our end that De Jong is digging his heels in and saying this in order to unlock the deferred wages that they owe him and not because he doesn't want to join United. Or is there something more to that? I know he wants to stay at Barcelona, obviously. He's made that clear, but it's posturing <laughs> a little bit, isn't it? The, the way you sort this out, Scott, is you get in front of a microphone with a journalist and you say it out loud today. I am not going anywhere and I'm staying at this football club. I'm going to honour my contract. It's not said that. That's, uh, what we're seeing is reporting around these subjects in terms of intermediaries. So we do know that Frank de Jong did always want to stay at Barcelona. We know that he settled there, loves uh, Catalonia, wants to do all that. His fiance really loves living out there. All of those things are important to individuals, aren't they? But ultimately, Frank de Jong spoke to Eric Ten Hag a few weeks ago and said, if Barcelona are going to sell me, I only want to come and play for you. That was that. Yeah, so that's where it was left. And we know that this is all about Barcelona and their business, not really what Man United are trying to do. So we also heard only a few days ago that Manchester United Friday was the deadline for this deal. And if there was no movement in terms of Barcelona's side, uh, they were going to pull the plug. They were not in, They were not going to carry on this. As you just said, they, they, they look silly in all of this, but it's not really their fault. They want the player and they're seeing a huge opportunity here to buy a top player who can really move the needle of the team quickly. Um, so you wait. You have to be patient at times. You don't You do not do it by social media, Scott. You don't wait and see if fans are happy or not. You do it in the boardroom. That's where it works. Frankie Young, if, if Barcelona want to sell him, we know they want to sell him. He's got to go. He can't stay at the football club. He just simply cannot. He could dig his heels in until he gets his money. But is he going to sit on the sidelines behind six other midfielders and earn... 
three hundred and sixty grand a week, going up to I think four hundred grand a week this season. Grand a week, yeah. So he's going to earn four hundred grand a week, and Barcelona won't use him. It's not going to happen. And if it was going to happen, they would not be buying Bernardo Silva. It's just simple as that. Bernardo Silva is going to cost a ton of money, probably maybe even more than De Jong. His stock is really high, obviously, in Manchester City. And Manchester City are not going to sell unless they get top dollar. So all of these things are aligning now. And as I've said countless times, the dominoes are about to fall. And I think that once one falls, you know, with Silva, Kessie was the first one, I think, with Barcelona, then you're in a position here that, that De Jong will have to leave the football club at some point. But let's see if he's on that plane. Because if he's on that plane then we're going to be talking about this deal for another three or four weeks. We will be. It's just it's just yeah. the way it is. But I do think that Manchester United have got to a point of saturation. They do understand that if they don't get De Jong now, they've got 45 days to go and find an alternative. Maybe that alternative, maybe, maybe, maybe is Savage and Zidane. You don't know. But you could put those two in there and have them as a development project while you find the midfielder you really want. Don't, don't say that to fans, Rob. Don't don't. They'll get upset. That. I you, know. You like, I, I, I'll get if I, you know, if I put it on Twitter, and and I might put it on Twitter. I, I I get why people react to stuff like that, but I think football is an organic business. You know, you 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 build it from the ground up. You don't just buy a star. De Jong isn't really a star, is he? He's just a top footballer. But he could become a star. But you're going to buy him, aren't you? And pay a really big fee for him and then start building around him. He might not be very good for the first six months. Who knows? I think De Jong is so important to United's overall strategy for the year um, and for the first for Ten Hag's first season. It's yeah. obvious that he's so in- integral to... You see the deficiencies in the midfield in preseason. Now, yeah. there are other players who are good, probably not another midfielder on the market who's as good as Frankie De Jong. I mean, no. I, not that one I can think of off the top of my head. He's better, better than Ruben Neves. He's better than Tielemans. You know, he's worth the chase. I think if they can end up getting him, I still do think they will. But it's, are you are you sick of it? It's difficult to say I'm sick of it because it's our job. So, like you know, trans- the transfer market is a huge part of our job twice a year. But the transfer market never really stops. It still goes even when it's closed. But I think in terms of the project for Manchester United and as Manchester United fan, I am patient. You know, so I'm not sick of it. If we get the player, I would be really kind of a bit perturbed if Frankie De Jong does get in front of a microphone today, tomorrow, on tour somewhere, and says. No, I'm not, I, I'm not going anywhere. And Barcelona say, oh, do you know what? We've actually paid him off and now we want him in our first team. That would probably annoy me. But ultimately, if he doesn't come, I'm also not going to cry about that because I'd rather just see you get players in that fit for you and work for you. No, don't get sold on the individual, Scott. Think about the team. And I think, again, just in these two preseason games, I'm happy with the bits and pieces that we're seeing. Yeah, uh, I think United would end up with egg on their face, though, if they did waste all that time. But, you know, they clearly think that De Jong will join them. It's just we understand that this uh, deferred wages issue is probably the issue which has not yet been sorted out, which might unlock the deal however long it takes. Let's talk about potential departures. Uh, Cristiano Ronaldo, the Chelsea interest has been dropped since we last spoke. Mm -hmm. That's not a thing. Bayern Munich, potentially losing Robert Lewandowski, have previously publicly ruled out moving for Ronaldo, but will that situation change if they lose Lewandowski? They do have a number of forward options already. Is that Does that make sense? Not, not entirely sure. PSG seemingly out of the race for him, but Ronaldo has had a massive offer from Saudi Arabia, which he is not going to take. I think it was 275 million euros over two years and about a 25 million-ish fee to United, which would have helped United replenish obviously, but it doesn't fit Ronaldo's desires to play in the Champions League and to be at the top level. Obviously, he's that's not the top level of football. Um, are there any options left for him? Is he going to come back tail between his legs? He, I, did you notice on his Instagram on Thursday, he posted a picture of him working out, working hard, and it seemed like he was wearing a pair of Man United Adidas shorts. <laughs> <laughs> I know. He no got the logo. parcel, then, did he? He got the parcel, did he, to to, to wear the United gear? Um, uh, do you know what? I'm going to take this from the United angle because that's the way I always try and take it. I don't care about Cristiano Ronaldo. I really don't. I think next year 
He'll score lots of goals if he stays at ours. And I think he will be moved out of the team over a period of time because I don't think that like, I keep imagining him in this, in this tour team. So every time we see stuff, we see Martial and we go, Oh, Martial did well with Bruno, these partnerships, these pairings. I'm thinking, Hmm, does Cristiano do that in a 10 hog system? And most of the time, my answer in my brain is no, he won't do that because he does what he wants. So let's see, because I think if he wants to stay at Man United, he's going to have to be committed. You know, he can't be playing games. And I also believe that if Ten Hag can strengthen the core of the team, we just talk about, you know, someone like Martinez coming in, being a heartbeat and, you know, having this kind of real agenda to succeed. Cristiano doesn't fit that. He's gone. That's what happened at Juventus. When he went, the Juventus dressing room went, great player, but off you go. We're going to get on with it now. They were they were fine with it. And I actually think Man United players will be exactly the same as that. They, they know that the, the agenda is to win under a new manager. It's not about Cristiano. So Cristiano can do whatever he wants. There's a World Cup coming up. A move to Saudi Arabia in the middle of a Qatar World Cup. You say, like, you know, saying there doesn't fit his agenda. I think if his agenda is earning a million pound a week or something like that, he might just try it. Maybe it does. Hmm. Does I'm he really sure. want to win the Champions League? Like, is he going to go anywhere to win the Champions League? Let's be honest. Is there a Champions League winning club out there for him that he can go and play Champions League football and win? None of them want him. None of them want him. I said about Chelsea a few weeks ago, if you're signing Raheem Sterling, you are not signing Cristiano Ronaldo. Why? Because Cristiano will not gel with that player. It's like a bit like Bruno and Sancho with Cristiano. So I, I, I think with Cristiano, I don't think it's about Champions League football. I really don't. I don't think it's about playing at the highest level. I think it's about money. It's the end of his career. And where will he go to earn that money? Saudi Arabia might be a sad place for him to end his career or go there, but he could go there two or three years and earn something like 100, 200 million pounds. Would you do it, Scott? <laughs> it's incomprehensible money, Rob. Uh, exactly it is yeah. it's, it's it's such huge for him money. i'm not sure is it incomprehensible for him i'm not sure but well yeah. if he played in saudi arabia he could live in portugal literally just go backwards and forwards on a private jet and and do that so it, it, there, there's lots of options for him and there is no big club out there i think at the moment that really desires cristiano ronaldo what about jesse lingard uh also do we He's not a United player anymore, obviously, but he could be returning to... He's got three offers from the Premier League. I think he wants to make a decision mm -hmm. within the next week or so. He also has an offer from Saudi Arabia, which apparently he is considering. Well, if Jesse goes to Saudi Arabia at this point of his career, he's a complete mug. I'll say that out there and be completely straight about it. Because he could still go and play somewhere at his age and do well. We saw what he could do at West Ham. So if you're going to take the money option, kind of, it's not the back end of his career. He's not a young player anymore, but he's not completely ancient, is he? He could still play Premier League level. And there's no doubt about it. Then I think that would be shocking and really surprised. Not so. I wouldn't be surprised if Ronaldo does it at 38, 39 years old. But I think with Jesse, it's it, there's a lot of conflicts. I think in his world in terms about what he wants to do. He always wanted to stay at Man United, but understood that. He probably wasn't going to play, didn't get the opportunities, did so well in London, showed that he can hack it there, back in the England squad. And he's done all of that. And he's just back down there again, isn't he? So I'm surprised he's not signed for a club yet. I think he will stay in the Premier League. Just go, and go, I hope go to West Ham. Just go to West Ham. Go to West Ham, go to Newcastle, go somewhere. Go somewhere where you can be one of like four or five or six main players and show that you're a great number 10, that you can play wide, you can play midfield, and even play as a false nine. Man United could have used him in all of those roles, but let's be honest, you've still probably got players who are better than him, and that's exactly why he's not at the football club anymore. Yeah. Uh, any final thoughts, Rob? We have Wednesday United's next game. Who do, who do they play next? Let's see. Google that. Sorry. Palace. Uh, it's Palace, is it? We have it Palace is. on Tuesday. Aston Villa next Saturday, and then Atletico Madrid and Rayo Vallecano in two consecutive days mm -hmm. before the Brighton game on the 7th of August. Things are looking good, though, aren't they? And hopefully a couple of new signings over the next few days will lighten the mood a little bit and add to the good feeling which is starting to build.
Yeah, in terms of the tour, I actually think the Palace game will be infinitely tougher than the Liverpool game. Infinitely tougher. Here you've got a, a Palace team really at the top of their development stage. You know, I think Vieira has done an incredible job with them. They're physical, they're technical. They're all the things that you kind of want to be. That's the stuff that you want to take and apply. Young players doing it for, for the manager. And, and they're a year ahead of Man United on that cycle. So I think you might see that. that this might be a real kind of kind of high-paced, tough Premier League-style game. And will Man United be able to do the technical stuff that maybe we've seen in games one and two against the side that's well-honed? So uh, i kind of looking forward to that one because it's something different. Uh, I'm not going to really take too much from beating Melbourne. And really, let's be honest, you beat Liverpool. It's, it's a nice bragging rights game, but it's the very first game. So fitness levels, you think, in the next match will be higher. Yeah, definitely some things to work on, as Eric Ten Hag has admitted. There's definitely some encouraging signs as well. Some good young players uh, getting their chance and starting to impress some signings on the way. Seems like we've been talking about them for bloody ages, but it feels like we're nearly there with a couple of them. Uh, Frankie de Jong, we wait and see. But thank you very much for listening, everyone. Uh, you can subscribe to our channel. Uh, and I'll show wherever you get your podcasts on Apple, Google, Spotify, all of those podcast platforms. And you can watch us on YouTube on Tuesdays and Fridays as well. So head over to that channel, The Promised Land and Manchester United Podcast, I believe. If you want the full name, if you want to put it in your YouTube search bar, hit the like button on this video and all the other videos we've done. We've been on YouTube for a while now. Subscribe, join the community, and the link should be in the description of this episode as well if you're listening on one of those said audio platforms. And Twitter, at underscore Scott Saunders, at underscore Rob, underscore B, and at Promise and MU for the show. Get in touch with us. Uh, we'll be enjoying our weekends. It's meant to be absolutely melting over the next few days, Rob, so I hope you don't melt away and you enjoy the weather. Uh, but it's nice to have some football to talk about that's positive from a Man United perspective. So thanks for listening, everyone, and we'll catch you soon.